Well, good morning and welcome to the service of morning prayer. And I can't believe that we are in March already. So I invite you to quieten your hearts and minds as we come into this sacred space, this thin space, and that we are conscious of the presence of God that is always around us, regardless of where we are and what we are doing. Quick adjustment of everything. So let us pray. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Amen. To the self-made person, the message of Christ crucified is a stumbling block. Lord, keep me, your servant, from arrogance. Don't permit it to have dominion over me. To the intellectual snob, the cross is just religious nonsense. Lord, keep me, your servant, from arrogance. Don't permit it to have dominion over me. O God, our rock and our salvation, no person sees all their own errors. Free me from those faults I hide from myself. And let the words of our mouths and the things we mull over in our heads be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our redeemer. Thank you, most loving God, for the opportunities offered in this community of love. Opportunities which have been created by the grace of your crucified Son. Do not allow us to be like spectators, but draw us into the soul of the prayers and scriptures. Let us be ready to hear within, yet beyond us, that living word which surpasses all human sentences as the sunrise surpasses a candle. Through Jesus Christ, your crucified Son, Amen. And so we come into a time of confession. When it comes to putting faith into practice, we're not very smart, yet we are not as dense as we sometimes pretend. We're not particularly good, but not as hopeless as sometimes we may fear. We are not remarkably loving, but not as insensitive as our words and deeds might suggest. We have bad days on which we look back with disappointment and considerable frustration. We have better days when we can gratefully look back at the light and love we have shared. We are what we are, yet also we are what your saving grace is making of us. We thank you for your forgiveness which expunges our shame, for your word of love that reconstitutes our confidence for your belief in us which enhances our gifts for use in your service and for your joy which replaces a sense of duty with a rush of delight. Please, saving God, continue your healing work in us. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, God who is both power and love, Forgive us and free us from our sins, heal and strengthen us by his spirit and raise us to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. So we pray, merciful Father, we have no power in ourselves to help ourselves. When we are discouraged by our weakness, give us strength to follow Christ, our pattern and hope, who 
who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. Amen. So I'd like to share with you the Gospel passage for today, which comes from John chapter 2, and it begins at the 13th verse. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise you up. And the Jews then said, This temple's been under construction for 46 years, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. And after he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. We give thanks to the Lord for his glorious gospel and praise to Christ our Lord. So on one level, I'm a little bit annoyed because I just got into my rhythm looking at the gospel of uh, Mark and all of the different uh, ways in which he is looking at all of these different bits and pieces. But here we are in the third Sunday of Lent, and we've jumped out of that, and we're into the Gospel of John. And we're into this, uh, again, for many of us, familiar story of Jesus cleansing the temple. Uh, A great story of great passion and power, which uh, many of us like to kind of... uh, Uh, latch on to, to say, well, Jesus wasn't just meek and mild, he was passionate and angry, and uh, he also spoke really strongly, and that serves us well when we want to justify our actions uh, of anger, perhaps. The thing about John's version of this, it's quite different to the other versions in the other Gospels. Now, the thing about it, first of all, is that it happens directly after the wedding at Cana and right at the beginning of John's Gospel. Whereas in the other Gospels, it's almost like a culmination. Um, it's, a, it's a story that comes after all of the ministry and the big journey towards Jerusalem that tends to happen in the other Gospels. But here in John's, it's one of the first big public acts that he does before he does all of the other healings, before he does anything else. All he's done so far is he's turned water into wine. Now, John has a slightly different agenda to the other Gospels and in this particular reading it highlights that. I mean, this is a a Gospel that is written in hindsight and I think it echoes for us that it has um, a very particular theology or metaphorical meaning. And John says so himself, um, where where the Jews said, this temple's been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up after three days? I mean, uh, they're taking a very literal uh, sense to his work, uh, to his words, but then John emphasises that, and it says here, uh, he was speaking of the temple of his body. And then John says... Well, after he was raised from the dead, when all this stuff came true, um, the disciples remembered. So it is looking back in hindsight to highlight a theological meaning. And so it's not 
uh, a blow-by-blow -blow live description of what happened. And I think it reminds us that we need to be careful that this is a different genre of writing to biography or history, that this is very much a theological document. And John, in particular, emphasises throughout his version of the stories of Christ the theology of who Jesus is. And right here at the beginning of his ministry, G John is speaking clearly of the nature of the ministry that Jesus is to come and the inevitable and uh, ongoing um, leading up to this death and dying and resurrection, the raising up. So right here at the beginning of John's Gospel, Jesus is talking about the raising, the resurrection. So on the very first point I'd make is that an important thing for us to hold as we're travelling through these uh, stories to Lent of Lent and then getting into Holy Week, that we always should be looking at everything that happens in the scriptures through the lens of the resurrected Jesus, that we know that the end of the story, and I, I say that many times. The other thing that um, I would uh, probably like to have a look at it again is, is this whole thing about the destruction in the temple? And you think, what a weird thing for Jesus to go in and destroy the temple. And, and the other Gospels, quite specifically, are reflecting on how Jesus is responding to the injustices that are happening there. The fact that poor people are getting ripped off. John has a slightly different kind of take on this and, and it is more about a comment on the nature of the temple itself and what it's for and how that connects to the person of Jesus. Perhaps highlighting that um, the temple as a sacred space is important, it's a thin place, it's a, a place in which people can encounter God. But also I suspect that message for us that it is not the only place that Jesus, in, in fact, has um, uh, replaced the temple as the, the locus of the Spirit of God and that Spirit of God can be experienced anywhere. What I like about this is I, I had, again, a look at the, the Greek and, um, and, and particularly that word destroy. Destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. And... And, you know, destroy is a good, strong word. Another way of looking at, apparently, is it's a similar word to loose or to liberate, to cut free, to um, uh, allow it to be what it is designed to be. So rather than destroying it um, in this sense, um, perhaps there's this sense of both the temple and Jesus himself through the action of the cross being loosed or liberated um, to be what is meant to be. And I like that sense uh, here in Lent that perhaps that's what it's about for us. And, you know, it's pretty straightforward. I don't have to embroider this too much. I think the purpose of Lent is for us to loose ourselves to liberate ourselves from the things that bind us up, the things that get in the way of our relationship with Christ. Being liberated to be the person that we are meant to be, to be able to sift through the things that bind us up and to undo those knots so that we are free, that we are liberated. So in a very simple level, my prayer for you today is that this Lent can continue to be for you a time of examining those knots that are inside you, those knots or binds that uh, stop us from being the person that we are meant to be and that in studying them and acknowledging them and naming them and perhaps loving them, we can unloose them so that we can be free to be what God has called us to be. That's my greatest desire in the world and I wish that for you. Amen.
those who have the, the wee sheet might like to join me in this canticle of thanksgiving. Let us give thanks to our loving God. It is our joy and privilege to do so. We thank and praise you, loving and glorious God, bountiful in creation and prodigious in redemption. Our thanks and praise are yours, most wonderful God. We praise you for the Christ of Nazareth, who heals the sick, befriends the misfits, forgives the sinner and wakes the dead. Our thanks and praise are yours, most wonderful God. In this holy season of Lent, we thank you for Christ's tough love, for his conquest of beguiling, beguiling temptations, for his resolute final journey to Jerusalem, for his zeal for your house of prayer, for his faithfulness under betrayal, trial and abuse, and for his love willingly poured out on the cross. Our thanks and praise are yours, most wonderful God. We give thanks for his undying care of him, for your undying care of him, for his risen presence face to face with women and men who became his witnesses to the end of the world. And today we have become numbered among those millions who have been granted this gift of faith and have received from his lips the spirit of of peace. Our thanks and praise are yours, most wonderful God. Well, let's pray for the world and for all of God's people. We pray for the people we take for granted, family, friends, good neighbours and loyal workmates for the producers and preparers of our bread, meat and fruits, those who maintain power, gas and water supplies, all who drive buses, trains, trams, taxis and those who pilot planes, people who deliver our mail, collect our garbage, mend our roads and give us weather forecasts. Gracious God, bless your people and encourage any who are forgotten, neglected, misused or whose duties have become too heavy to bear. We pray for people we may recognise and admire. Firefighters, ambulance officers, nurses, surgeons and therapists, radio announcers, writers, film personalities, musicians and sports stars and those intrepid souls who fight corruption in high places or the many who serve as volunteers abroad in dangerous circumstances. Gracious God, bless your people and encourage any who are forgotten, neglected, misused or whose duties have become too heavy to bear. We pray for those people for whom some of us may have mixed feelings. Some among the judges, politicians, journalists, police officers and traffic wardens. Dietitians, physiotherapists, psychiatrists, school teachers and social welfare officers. Employees, employers, Unionists, managers, and those who tell us it is time to retire. Gracious God, bless your people and encourage any who are forgotten, neglected, misused, or whose duties have become too heavy to bear. We pray for those people who may annoy us a lot pontificating social commentators, wordy politicians, unloving ethicists, dogmatic scientists, verbose clergy, unbending environmentalists and eco economists, hair-splitting lawyers, petty bureaucrats, repetitive TV interviewers and religious zealots. 
Gracious God, bless your people and encourage any who are forgotten, neglected, misused, or whose duties have become too heavy to bear. And now we pray for those particular people for whom we have special concern this day. We name them before you. Helen, Sid, Danny, Anne, Colin and Helen, Diane, Hilary, Susan, Maya, Joan, Fiona, Joyce, Margaret, Muriel, Greg. For our NHS workers, for those who are vaccinators and those who are vaccinated. for equitable access to vaccines worldwide. For those who have experienced sexual assault and whose voices are not heard, Whatever their personal need or crisis, whatever their age, health, sins, faults or virtues, we ask you to guide, guard, nurture and sustain them. Gracious God, bless your people and encourage any who are forgotten, neglected, misused or whose duties have become too heavy to bear. And as our Saviour Christ has commanded and taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, now and forever. Amen. Well, we meet in Christ's name. So let us share his peace. Peace of God be with all of you. And so a blessing. Remember that the wisdom of Christ may appear foolish and the strength of God may seem like weakness. But those who walk by faith will discover both true wisdom and inexhaustible strength. The saving mercies of our Lord Jesus Christ, the providential and loving ground of God and the embracing fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today, tomorrow and forevermore. Amen. We'll go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Well, it's been lovely to share this time with you in this lovely space. Uh, plans are well and truly ahead for uh, Easter. At this stage, we are planning that we're unable to gather, but uh, if uh, restrictions lift here in uh, Scotland and we are able to, we will look at that. But at this stage, let's plan that we will be at home and sharing in prayer over Holy Week together in this format. I hope there are good things happening for you this week, uh, even if it's as simple as being able to get the lid off the jam jar without struggling. 
uh, or as wonderful as uh, an amazing vista uh, of sunrise or sunset that lifts your heart. Be good, behave, and I'll see you this time next week. <laughs>